Hi. I uh, briefly wanted to look at the concept of decision making through a little example that I often call the drive through dilemma. Now, the drive through dilemma is where you are in the drive through at your favorite fast food establishment and you have all the good intentions of ordering the healthiest thing on the menu but when you get up to the when you get up to the little box where you have to talk into the microphone and tell the person what you want you wind up ordering probably the worst thing on the menu so you told yourself that you're going to get the salad but instead you wind up ordering the double cheeseburger deluxe and when we think about this this uh, kind of this kind of dilemma in decision making, we can think about different parts of the brain that might be responsible for helping us to make this decision and how certain contextual factors might influence whether we make what in the long run might be considered the best decision or the right decision. So the two different areas of the brain that I'd like to uh, focus on are the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex here on the lateral and dorsal surface of the brain and the orbital frontal cortex which is actually just behind the uh, the orbit of the eyes on the ventral surface of the brain here. Now the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is involved in working memory and it's involved in long-term planning so mapping out what the consequences of an action might be over the long term whereas the orbital frontal cortex is believed to be involved in taking note of the possible immediate consequences so it's very sensitive to changes in reinforcement and punishment so when you're up in the uh, up in the drive-through lane and let's say you're hungry but you're not that hungry uh, you've eaten throughout the day you are uh, let's say your blood sugar levels are okay and your thirst has been quenched in that situation and in that state of uh, in that state of mind in that state of body in a sense you might be more likely to actually order the salad let's say the chicken salad and you'll get the grilled chicken instead of the fried chicken because your immediate need for reinforcement is not that great you're not really worried about uh, about how something's going to taste right now something sounds good enough because on a cognitive level it's healthy uh, it's not bad for you so you go with the salad however let's say you haven't eaten in a while and that picture on the menu of the double cheeseburger looks really really good in this instance the orbital frontal cortex the neurons of the orbital frontal cortex are going to respond quite strongly because they're taking note of this possibility of immediate gratification immediate positive reinforcement so in certain situations one cognitive capacity might overwhelm the other. A need for immediate reinforcement might overwhelm the desire to maintain behavior in light of long-term consequences. So again, behavior in terms of long-term consequences or in light of long-term consequences might be more the purview of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and behavior that is going to meet the needs of immediate reinforcement might be activating the orbital frontal cortex more strongly. Now uh, this has applications and implications for for addictions and uh, and not only pharmacological addictions but behavioral addictions and this is coming mostly from the work of Dr. Nora Volkow so if somebody has been addicted to a substance, if they are addicted to, let's say, cocaine, and they've actually overcome their addiction, imaging studies have shown 
that in those instances, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, where somebody can actually overcome a craving and go without choosing the drug, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is responding most strongly in those situations, and the orbital frontal cortex is responding less strongly in those situations. So uh, people who can't actually overcome their cravings show more activation in that ventral part of the brain in the orbital frontal cortex. So by understanding some of the neurological mechanisms, not to say that it's excusing the behavior or that it's necessarily fully explaining the behavior, but it can help us to understand the behavior and perhaps implement better uh, treatment protocols and different types of therapy. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy has been shown to be very effective in uh, helping to maintain uh, achievements in addictions, meaning if somebody is uh, able, to, able to overcome a craving, practicing that, practicing restraint, practicing self-control can actually uh, help the individual over the long term. And again, uh, so this is showing that through neuroplasticity in the brain, in the brain, that cognitive therapies, behavioral therapies can help to improve what we might consider or might call uh, uh, volition or willpower. So again, not to not to completely reduce the behavior to a set of neurological mechanisms, but more to help to uh, explain the behavior and point out that changes in the brain uh, often are reflexive or reflective of changes in behavior and vice versa. So a person's behavior changes and their brain states are going to change. And, and uh, in, in light of that as well, or similar to that concept, if somebody has brain damage due to dr extended drug use or perhaps just due to head injury, they might show changes in behavior which show or, or are, uh, are illustrated in their inability to make long-term decisions that are, are good for them, adaptive, and uh, they might need cognitive rehabilitation in those instances.